Bhatia City Expats Club is a non-profit social organisation and our speakers are volunteers. The club as such assumes no responsibility or liability for the professional reputation of or the quality of services provided by the speaker today. that I meet a lot of particular characters and these characters seem to me to have something about them which is crazy. And by crazy, I, I would like to include terms like folly, madness, craziness, lunacy. Now, I could go through and list a number of people I know whom I consider to be a bit mad. But one of the things that I've noticed about a friend recently is that I can't talk to him. He only talks to me, and he never listens. And for me, that means that there's a sort of breakdown going on. And I think that madness is partly about breakdown. And I think that Patio can induce madness, or can be a springboard into madness, for a lot of people, especially unstable people, who, or people who drink a lot. Now, Thailand is very well known for its very harsh laws on drugs, and it's, I think Thailand is actually proud of its reputation of sending people to jail and not allowing them back in. But of course, if you were to say to the Thai authorities that there are three intoxicants or drugs or substances that they really do embrace, I think the Thai authorities would be a bit sad about that. And what I'm talking about here is, one is alcohol, because it is an intoxicating substance. And if you look up its effect after the second drink, you are starting to become intoxicated. Toxin, tox, retox, detox. And if you then go on to tobacco, Thailand sells very cheap tobacco. And that is also something which many people have had bad experiences about, but over the long term, these things get you over the long term. But one thing which Thailand really has embraced, and this is partly to do with affluence, is fast food and substances that are in fast food, sugar. Sugar is probably the number one killer over the long term. And so these things, I think, are important because they tend to set the scene for what seems to happen in Patia, what seems to happen in Patia, and what this book, Dear Patia, is about. It's about people actually doing crazy things and going crazy. Now, what really is the craziest thing you can do in Patia? Well, in my opinion, it's riding on Sukhumvit Road without a crash helmet on a motorbike, drunk at 100 or 160 miles an hour. And when you look at the Thai news, which unfortunately doesn't come on at 6 o'clock at night, it tends to be throughout the day, you see some incredible accidents. And these accidents involve people who seem to be suicidal. And they, they just crash into trucks and they get killed. And after riding on Sukhumvit without a crash helmet, I think something that Patio invites you to do, which is pretty dangerous, is obviously to have unlimited sex with unlimited number of, with an unlimited number of people in, un, in numerous ways. And in fact, the book Dear Patia came about because a friend of mine called Franz, or Frank, from Austria, he's sometimes referred to as Fritz, or Fritzy Boy, he actually said to me, look, John, I'm going back to Austria, I'm going to Linz, I'm going to be a farmer again, I'm going to run the family business, but I want you to write to me, and I want you to stimulate my libido from afar. 
And what I want you to do is I want you to introduce or to write as many dirty stories, the type of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales without the serious ones thrown in. I want you to write as many stories as you can, stimulating my libido, because I'm on this farm, I'm killing pigs, my only real pleasure is chopping down trees. Frank mentions this in a few of his emails. And I need to remember Patea, because I need to be stimulated to get back. But France, in a certain sense, was one of these people who, who was unreliable. And I think patio punters are unreliable. And after a certain moment, he stopped communicating. He may be married in Austria from his dating site. But it's he, it's France, who stimulated dear patio. And dear patio is dear patio because the book started with emails. And emails seem to me to be very important because they are very rapid ways of communication, but just as in the centuries past, letters form novels, I think that emails can stimulate novels, can form novels. And in fact, a lot of this book, and God help me if France was a violent person, but a lot of this book is direct emails from France. And they are funny, they're funny because France's English is not too good. For example, he's, he talks about Instead of saying antics, he talks about antiques. So he makes mistakes with his English all the time, which, in my opinion, is fairly funny. And he also, obviously, had unlimited sex and got very ill. He got very ill while he was here, and he carried that illness back to Austria. And indeed, when we come on to listen to France talking, because this is authentic France, you will, you, I hope you will find him funny but at the same time, a serious funniness, because really there is, there is a lot to contemplate in, in what Francis is saying about his good time, his good time in Patia. And this good time in Patia, it's fairly obvious, I think, to, to many people after a certain age, that there are good times and good times. A good time which does you good is a really good time, and a good time which does you bad probably isn't. And there are good times which don't do you any good. And I'm not just talking about that headache from drinking too much. I'm talking about accidents, getting into fights, condoms breaking, riding motorbikes, falling over, knocking your head, any number of things. And I again come back to that point I made about Thailand and drugs. A recreational drug, alcohol, is readily available and it's readily abused. There's nowhere in, in Patio that says you use responsibly or drink responsibly. And indeed, Heineken is probably suspect as well when it asks us to be responsible. But to come back to this point about madness, I've already said that I'm not an expert in madness by any means. And I was pleased at the beginning, before I began to speak, to talk to two, two of the audience and to ask them if they ever remember R.D. Lang. Now, R.D. Lang was a Scottish psychiatrist who came to fame in the 60s and 70s, and he wrote a book on, he wrote many books. His most famous book is The Divided Self, in which he explains schizophrenia. Because while I'm not particularly good at madness, I do know that things like schizophrenia, or paranoia, or megalomania are, I think, pretty serious illnesses. But R.D. Lang came to fame because he joined hands with the Beatles. And he went off to places like India, and he, he went transcendental there. And he, he was really on a big drug high. And part of his fame came about because he explained that, really, mad people are not mad, but society is mad. Or mad people are not mad, but the family that they, they, they come from or came from is mad. So he sort of helped to de-responsibilise um, mental illness. And he, he came to fame, but he was also attacked by other psychiatrists and ended up, ended up having a breakdown himself. So R.D. Lang is important in the sense that I know when I, I'm giving a talk on madness in Patia that I'm basing the talk on an assumption. The assumption is that everybody in this room, or at least the majority of you, 
believe that there are forms of behaviour which are crazy and which in the end can be, can be diagnosed as unstable or mentally ill. For example, personality disorders are fairly widespread. They're not gone into very much, but they come out. But of course, alcoholism is another problem area. And so when I give a talk on madness, I have to say at the beginning that, uh, that I'm, as I say, I'm not an expert, but I think that there is a lot of madness. I think that Franks, in his own way, was a bit mad. And he does actually mention in an email that he did go mad in Patia. He explained some of his problems as being mad. And the talk is on how to avoid madness in Patia or not. Well, how to avoid madness, it's fairly simple in my opinion. You don't go out too much, you have one partner, you don't abuse substances, and you, you base your, your behavior, your life on, on the seven cardinal virtues, which I imagine most people in this room don't know. And then obviously the other thing that, that maybe I mentioned directly and indirectly in the book are, are the seven deadly sins or the seven deadly vices, which again, most people don't know. Now, I'm not asking you to believe in an almighty here, but I am asking you to go to Google and start to look up some of these. You'll find things like sloth, greed, gluttony. And these are, these are problems because they do lead to other serious problems and they can actually be deadly. Now, the good thing about the talk, the really good thing for me, is that I went and I looked for patty and madness, patty and madness on the internet. And I could only find something about go-karts. <laughs> so, so I'm really extremely pleased that I'm going to be able to do something original, to talk about madness in Patia, and that it seemingly has skipped the internet. Because when I go to my favourite guy, Shakespeare, and I, and I look up Shakespeare and madness, there's an infinite variety of things from Shakespeare on madness, because the guy was obviously obsessed. He was an obsessive, compulsive writer, about madness, but it's there. Now you all think that when King Lear does this and says, Oh Lear, 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 beat at this gate, but let thy folly in, and thy dear judgment out, you actually think, oh yeah, Shakespeare was writing about madness in tragedies. But he wasn't. He was obsessed. The histories are full of mad kings. They're full of people fighting wars and killing people to gain power. But what about the comedies? Where is the word madness mentioned most often? The word madness is mentioned most often in Twelfth Night, which is a romantic comedy. And so what you have to sort of start to think about is that while Dear Patio doesn't mention madness very much, if madness keeps on being mentioned a lot, then a person is thinking about it. So, Madness and Shakespeare. I thought to myself, okay, well that's Shakespeare, but what about Madness and George Eliot? And I went there, and everybody knows Silas Marlowe is a bit crazy. But there was a bit, there was a bit on Madness and George Eliot. And then I went and I looked at Dickens, and I thought to myself, okay, Dickens, is Dickens writing about Madness? And he is writing about Madness, there's quite a lot on the internet if you surf about Dickens and madness. Now without further ado, I'll go on to the emails which are the stimulation for writing about madness in Patia and for writing about the mad Franks. Even though I wrote him recently, said the book's published, I'm doing a talk, how about getting in touch? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing will come of nothing and nothing has come of nothing. But what I'm going to do first, first off is I'm going to read an email which I'm afraid is digressional. It's completely irrelevant unless you're following my train of thought. If you're following my train of thought, you'll know why I'm reading this email. It's from a millionaire, and it's the introduction to Frank's emails, and then I'll start to get Frank's in on the stage fire.
This is from a Patio millionaire. He's a property developer. He was a millionaire in England. And then he came over here and he married. He has a son from a Thai lady, so he's married. And he has a string, he has a string of Mia Noyes. He has a string of mistresses. And he is, in this email, he is complaining, he is complaining about what happened to him in a few months. And this email is significant because the English is poor. The man is deluded. And he is also asking for our sympathy. He's asking for our sympathy. I'll read it without further to do to point out that emails can be very important springboards into writing both fact and fiction. Because Dear Patio starts off with facts, the fact of these emails, and then it goes on to onto fiction. So a Patea millionaire is now lamenting the following. And sorry if it's a bit offensive, but at the same time, it is Patea. He's writing to me, and he's lamenting. Hi, I had enough of Patea. It just kicked in hard. I had a great setup, and in three months, I'm fighting to get my money from a project who are doing their utmost to give me issues not to pay. My number two girl for five years, who I now know I loved deeply, we are finished. And I will explain all about that. My girl from Sapphire, who is not such a big concern, has returned home. And I just realized or forgot, this city is dirty and full of fake people, drunks and prostitutes. This city has very few happy stories. And I'm hearing my friends having issues with these girls, and it's all about, they think it's love. And the girl is just money. And I see it so clear now. And my experience has suddenly made me say, that's enough. I don't want, I don't want any part of it. So that's this guy, who is still a millionaire. He's got his wife at home, and he's lamenting the fact that there are dishonest people here, and that his girl, his girl from Sapphire, is not bothering too much about him, and his me annoy has ditched him, and he wants us to be sympathetic. He wants a shoulder to cry on. A man who is deceived not only in his senses, but in the judgment of his mind, is bound to be considered close to madness. That's Erasmus. Erasmus, again, no man, myself included, no man is wise at all times or is without his blind side. Burton, in the Anatomy of Melancholy, calls self-love, self-love, a delectable frenzy, most irrefragable passion. He was ridiculed by Lawrence Stern in Tristram Shandy. But there we are, Erasmus, in praise of folly. Now that's actually not in praise of folly, it's a misleading title, in praise of folly. What is so foolish as to be satisfied with yourself or to admire yourself? Now these are very hard-hitting statements from these very old men. They're actually saying that we shouldn't believe in ourselves, whereas the internet is full of everybody telling us we should believe in ourselves. Do not let me hear of the wisdom of old men but rather of their folly. There's Dean Kuntz, who's a best-selling novelist. He says, humanity is a parade of fools 
and I'm at the front of it twirling a baton. <laughs> and I'm glad some people laughed because basically it's de-dramatizing the problems that those older writers were writing about. He's actually saying that he's enjoying the parade of fools and that he's actually going to be a leaguer of fools. And that's a very serious statement, even though it's extremely funny. Now, my last point before introducing you to France and letting the real McCoy take over is this point about folly, because I need to define madness as widely as I can. Folly is being foolish, isn't it? It's being stupid. It's not being able to understand what's in front of your nose. It's like those people who can tell you what's happening a thousand miles away, but can't tell you what's happening here in front of them. And I really want to ask you to consider whether you think children are foolish. Are children foolish? Can you put up your hands if you think children are foolish? Are children foolish? Okay, there are three people who think they're foolish. How many people think children are not foolish? Okay, the majority of the audience thinks children are not foolish. So why do we go around protecting children all the time? If we take them out of a car, they might run under a car. They're always going for medicine and wanting to pop the tablet box open and down some medicine. They're always having accidents and felling themselves. In my opinion, children are marvellous. They're resilient, they're, they're absolutely spontaneous, they're brilliant, but they are foolish. And folly or foolishness in children is obviously one thing. But listen to this, and then we'll go on to friends. Let a man meet a sheep bear robbed of her cubs rather than, rather than a fool in his folly. At the beginning, their words are folly. At the end, they are wicked madness. Okay, with no further to do, I'm going to ask Ren to impersonate France, and I would like you to listen to France talking about his experiences in Pattaya. Uh, this is my attempt at a Viennese accent, so apologies, Christian, I know you come from Vienna. Dear John, so last night I went to my favorite doctor who wants to come to Thailand, too. He listened to my story. He immediately sent me to a hospital in Linz, which has a microbiological lab to analyze the microorganism which I am suffering from. On the paper for the hospital, he wrote, unprotected sex in Thailand. So I went there and I had to show the paper to the lady at the registration at the hospital. She was not sure whether they would treat me the same day because another hospital was in charge for the walking patients. So she showed me to the Department of Dermatology where I had to show the paper again. I really got the impression the whole of Upper Austria know about my disease now. <laughs> After one and a half hours, I, go, I was called to go to a doctor. She was a young and pretty attractive one. A nurse was in the room too. She was really harsh and did not look at me. Total Nazi. I told the doctor my story and she interrupted me a few times asking, all this medication you took in Thailand, did you have one partner? Lady, man, both? Only ladies, but many. I answered. The nurse looked at me even more unfriendly. So they took my blood, urine, and a sniff on my mouth penis and anus. What gives me great hope is that the doctor, doctor looked at my penis and told me it does not look that bad from a medical point of view. Now the symptoms are vanishing, there is just a little tickling and hardly any outflow. So John, did you make any progress with your book? How is love? Best wishes to her. What about number 26 from Electric Shock at Blue Blue? You should really go there. If not, she will forget you. So girls are busy friends. So I, I then... I 
then I then write to Franz. I then write to Franz, and I'll, I'll read out this email. I say, hi Franz, regarding your magnificent final finale over here. As mentioned, you decided to do as much as possible, and you did even more. As for me, I'm keeping a low profile, getting over going out with you too much. The delights of the azure and blue blue bar are on the horizon, but as yet I haven't sat on the electric bar stool. Yes, it's incredible how much money Europe demands as it steps up law after law after law. Its regulators are gigantic greedies. I sometimes wonder, or don't, what they would do to our local fresh food market if they got the chance. And then I, I carry on, but I'll let um, Ren take over. Dear John, sorry for being late with my mail, but I was busy with my restaurant. Business is running okay. This week we, we slaughtered another three porks to feed my customers. Now I'm boss of the business, our family is running together. My 88-year-old grandmother went to hospital yesterday because of diarrhea. She is recovering and will come home tomorrow. I have already lost three of my four grandparents, but people, and especially me, seem to forget that our life is not endless. So this incident with my grandma reminds me of this not deniable fact. In conclusion, Apart from running a good business and the fact we all have to die sometime, I really should try to do something which is fun. I mean, when I am going to die and see death knocking on my door, I want to go from this planet with the memories I had some great experiences in Pattaya. So whatever happens, I really think I will go back to Pattaya and visit my friend over there. John, Please tell me about the experience you had hitting the town with your son and his friends. And don't forget about the dirty stories like breaking condoms. Okay, okay, that's enough. Okay, okay, that's enough. That's enough. That's absolutely enough. So we're, we're, we're going to end it there. Okay, thank you very much. happens is that I run out of steam. I can't keep up these sensational emails, partly because maybe it's not in the blood, it's not in my DNA to do so. And that's when the book takes on a far more fictional turn. But I thought, before I just conclude this talk with the sort of second part of the talk and the, after these emails, I thought you might like to hear about one of the characters who has to take over and continue writing. And then um, I'll get Franks to to met, to um, to actually talk to you about that. The man is Terry the King, and I say P.S. to Franks. I say Terry the King has been ill with a virulent virus in the lower region, so he's also got ill, and he's gone to the memorial in the international hospitals, and they are taking their time curing his bacterial infection. And then I mention some quotes, and Franks comes in, and he says as follows, and he says as follows, thanks. This Dear John, please, 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 lay off the quotes. <laughs> Who is this Terry, the king? And why do you never mention him? Or did you, and have I just forgotten? I hope he is not a figment of your excited imagination, or a convenient tool to enable you to cotswallop me into believing stories which are untrue, or Maybe birds. He's your mouthpiece, and by using him, you are avoiding taking responsibility for the direful and lustful episodes in your seemingly dull life. Not to mention your fiascos with number 26 from Electric Blues, who seems to have disappeared completely. Yes, you certainly effed up there, John, wrapping up phone numbers in banknotes. Or have you conveniently forgotten your antiques? I hope I am not being hoodwinked, but fear that I am. If you have noticed a significant improvement in my style of writing and my grasp of your mother tongue, it is because one of the ladies on my dating site put me in touch with a great English teacher and dedicated wanton. I owe him and his corrections the magnificent style which is intent on overtaking and flummoxing my previously poor epistles. 
France, Obama, and the working poor, but now your competitor in excellent letter produce. Thank you, Ray. You see, because the, the person writing that letter that Ray has read out is me, because what, what had happened in this novel is that I, I just couldn't keep up with these ridiculous emails stimulating Frank's libido from afar. And it had to develop. But the person who's taking over, who is called Terry the King, is actually a person I know. And he is a man who says to everybody, I am never wrong. I am never wrong. And so for me, he is another deluded, at this point, ex patia punter. Because he actually believes he's right in everything he says, even when he makes mistakes which are obvious to everybody else, he covers up. And so this sort of ego, which doesn't really allow for any self-development or education, self-education, goes back to really what Erasmus says about people who are in love with themselves, who can't seemingly sort out a way of, um, a way of going forward. Terry, Terry the King is, is obviously not a figment of my imagination, and he played out his last years in Patea with seven telephones in which he got lots of different ladies to phone him, and he would make arrangements to meet them, and then he would um, not turn up. And after a time, the girls in the bars became aware of this, and they started to talk to their Thai boyfriends, because many of the girls do have Thai boyfriends. And he found that he was in danger as he walked along the soys. At the same time, he'd been playing tricks on the lady in Bangkok who worked at the airport. And she was a serious girlfriend, and so he retired from Patia. He told everybody that Patia was finished. Not that Terry was finished, but Patia was finished. And he went off, and he is now living in Bangkok with his lady in Bangkok. But those last few months were dangerous for him, and he could have got beaten up quite badly. I do know people who mistreat the girls, and they do get beaten up. And so in the book, he gets beaten up, and he has to stop writing. And now we enter into a realm of complete fiction. We enter into a realm where I'm searching around for another writer who's going to stimulate France. And I, I knew a couple, these people are real again, I knew a couple who bought a house on the dark side of Patia. And they were trying to sell their house, but they were a relatively honest couple. And they told me that in the rainy season, the bathroom floods. And I asked them why, and they said, because all the water that comes out of the drains comes down the hill into our sewerage system and bubbles up a bit like the streets we see when they're downpours, bubbles up in the bathroom. And I kept in contact with Pam and Roger, and I wrote to them, and I, I in the book, this is now, they, they are real people, but I write in the book that I wrote to them, and I asked them for a substitute for me, for Terry the King, and they decided on sending over, sending over the cook. But the cook had robbed something from Woolworths, Woolworths in Great Britain. And Woolworths is a chain store which is no longer in existence. And so like with most criminals, this particular cook who had robbed something got blamed for the demise of Woolworths. And he comes over, but he comes over because... He comes over because of the seriousness of that. Because of the seriousness of his crime, he comes over with a social worker. And the social worker is called Gladys Maltz. And she is obviously a figment of my imagination, and the book is now going from, really from fact to fiction, very much, very much. It's obvious that there's, there are cross-cultural complications between Europe and Asia, and there are certainly cross-cultural complications between Thailand and Great Britain. And so it seemed to be fitting that after a certain moment, the social worker would um, asked the British authorities to intervene to change Pattaya, to stop a lot of its lawlessness, to stop a lot of the things which British people, true Brits, consider mad, like having fresh food with 
dogs urinating beneath the stalls, like having food with flies, which incidentally, if food has flies, they tell me it's good. If the flies keep away, <laughs> it's very bad. But we, from our very well-developed countries, we think to ourselves, no, no, no. If there are flies, we're going to get ill, and we often do get, in inverted commas, travelers' diarrhea. We're not actually travelers. So I put this social worker into the context of Walking Street. I put her in Soy LK Metro, in LK Metro. I put her in Soy Bukau, and I put her into the bars. But unbeknown to all of us, she's a covered lesbian. So she's actually, to an extent, enjoying the bars. But anyway, at a certain point, I write to France, whom I'm already very well aware is, is, not, going to, is not going to respond to is not going to respond to my emails anymore, that I've lost him as a friend. Maybe even because of the sort of person I am, which people, they take a bit of time. You meet me in a bar and you think to yourself, oh, this guy is okay. But underneath it, I'm not really okay. I'm not really okay because I actually do believe that there are virtue, there is virtue in humility. There is virtue in kindness. There is virtue in abstinence. There is virtue in chastity. There is virtue in patience. There is virtue in liberality. And there is virtue in diligence. So, Patio is now in danger of being closed down by the British authorities. And I, I send, I send France, I sent him the beginning of the report on lawless Thailand, okay? And this is pure fiction, but what France receives, allegedly, is a report on lawless Thailand, because the book is developing, the British authorities are here, the social worker is going mad, and she actually writes in her report as follows. The, the heading is Report on Lawless Thailand, Lawless Patia, Lawless Walking Street, Various Lawless Soys, including Lawless Soy 6, Lawless Soy 7, and Lawless Soy 8, LK Metro, Lawless, bars and eating houses in Soy Pukau, with recommendations for their immediate closure or law enforcement change and handcuff thwackery. Further, investigation into black market patia. Patia streets, hygiene in the food markets, cross-cultural cross uncomplications, assessments from Tesco whiz kids, and recommendations from A, social workers, B, embassy officials, C, police officers, D, Tom, Dick and Harry. Further, report on street crime and road accidents with recommendations on prevention, law enforcement and punishment for head crushers. Further, recommended methods for enabling the Thai authorities to implement changes and fund implemented changes to be made available and paid for by the British authorities, 1%, with the help of European Union funds, 99%, for the amelioration of third world states, countries, coup d'etats, banana republics, and other formidable military directorships, dictatorships, and mattorships. But <laughs> I find it funny. But anyway, so that's really what's happening in this novel. Katia is in danger. Now where am I going to come down on? Am I going to come down on the side of uh, getting rid of patia and getting rid of the fresh food which I enjoy at home once my partner has cleaned it and cooked it. I mean, I do really feel well here. Am I going, going to get rid of those surreal moments where I see my reflection in bar mirrors and I think to myself, yeah, you're, you've gone crazy. In fact, I did find myself in tears only recently when I met a dancer whom I'd known four years ago and I thought to myself, yes, in this other book, which happens to be by my feet, Great Tits I've Known and Other Species, I, I do mention the meanest to go-go that goes 
and give me thoughts that do often lie too deep for tears, which is a paraphrase of the end of Ode on Intimations by William Wordsworth. Here, this same book great its is Sexy Thai Bar Girls and Me, Sex Adventures in Asia. But I, I'm not really exactly what these books say. And so when I found myself in tears, I thought to myself, yes, you, you've actually gone a bit crazy, but am I going to close down Patia, which has inspired these books, which makes me blog regularly, which I still enjoy? Well, obviously, I don't think I am. And one of the reasons why I don't think I'm going to close it down is because the, of the endless sources of amusement, entertainment, inspiration and surprise which Katya has. <coughs> this, this is, this is a, a Nagogo dancer called Boo Boo, okay? And she is actually lamenting the fact that she has lost... Am I running out of time? Okay. And she has actually lost um, somebody, so she actually goes ahead and she talks about the person she's lost like this. She says, me love he and he love me, and he no love she, but she love he. And it goes on like that for about 20 minutes. And it's extremely funny, but I was given 30 minutes, I seem to have gone over, and I just want to conclude then by saying that what happens in the end is that Gladys gets hospitalised like most people who don't know Patia very well. And then in fact, she, in the end, she dies. And so she, she can't actually produce this report on Patia. And I end up by writing to a very absent Franks and I just say that I have to stand up for Patia because Franks has stood Patia up. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any questions? I enjoyed the talk very much. Uh, Mr. Randy here has always amuses me to uh, watch a uh, guy who came, this first comes to the patio, and he's talking to a bar girl, and he's just rattling on and on, and she's sitting there just nodding her head like she understands everything he's saying, but she really don't. And being a man of words, how do you handle that? I, I'm as amused as you are. And, and in fact, it's another sign, isn't it, that, that people are not connecting. And that is partly what what folly is about. It's about not not really being able to have these conversations. And these people actually are big heads, aren't they, as well? Because they, they're talking away about all sorts of things to the girls, and they, they're really quite unaware that they are talking to a brick wall. So I find it amusing. Um, just, uh, I'm thinking when I hear your talk that really what we need is a collection of short stories about funny stories about Patia. Um, because they are out there, because some of them are a little bit tragic on it, but there are a lot of funny stories about Patia. We should, I think, uh, I think there'd be people here if we write a funny story or two about Patia. Um, mm -hmm. So it's something to think about perhaps for your next book. Not just you, you write it, but other people write it as well. Yeah. And also, you want to mention that your books are for sale on the Excel. Yeah, okay, yes, the books here are for sale if anybody wants to get them for 90 or 100 baht. And uh, I'd appreciate some sales. Um, with regard to what Ren said, of course, there are some hilarious books out there um, that do have lots of stories about that and about these characters. For example, there's Learning Curve by a guy called. Uh, I can't remember his name, I think his surname's Thomas, but that's very funny. And then there are lots of others from actual writers resident in Patia talking about the funny side of Patia. Anyway, thanks very much. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, we have this certificate of appreciation for uh, your talk today. Uh, and as Ren said, there are some uh, books here that uh, are for sale. So if you feel so inclined, are they on Amazon as well? Or, uh... yeah, they're, they're on Amazon and Create.
spend. Okay, so if you miss the opportunity, 